welcome to the Speaking Business Podcast. This is your host, Maria Franzoni. Every week, I'll be talking to one of the amazing speakers I have the pleasure of working with through my speaker bureau. And together, we'll be finding out a little bit more about the person who is the speaker behind the mic. So my guest this week is Philip Hesketh, who is an expert in the psychology of persuasion and influence. He combines a powerful mix of well-researched persuasive techniques in buying, selling, persuading and influencing. He is best known for his can-use-today techniques to be more influential. Philip is a psychology graduate from Newcastle University and a sales graduate from Procter & Gamble. In 1986, he was creator, new business director and managing partner of an advertising agency, Advertising Principles. He sold his interest in the business after 16 consecutive years of growth, with the agency billing £48 million and employing 150 people. Two of his books, How to Persuade and Influence People and Persuade, are Amazon number one bestsellers. Phil is visiting fellow of Newcastle University and current holder of Vistage UK's Outstanding Performer, Most Requested Speaker and TEC <coughs> Australia's Overseas Speaker of the Year Award. Well done, Phil. That's fantastic. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. Good to be here. So, so Phil, let's go back to your early career and let's go back to uh, psychology and Procter & Gamble. So so why psychology? I was going to be a civil engineer. Uh, I did maths further, maths and physics, and didn't do well enough because of, well, I just didn't study hard enough. So I got a summer job on the dustbins and I met a guy who did uh, psychology at York University. I also knew a friend of my father's who was a psychologist and I thought, yeah, that's what I want to do. I don't want to be walking around with a yellow hard hat on. I want to be a psychologist. So that was the plan. Fantastic. And how did you get to be employed by Procter & Gamble? I mean, a great organisation to to, to be with. Hmm. Well, I was going to become a psychologist and I did 12 months in a psychiatric hospital. I was working there. I wasn't a patient and decided I didn't have the empathy for it. Uh, And I was looking around for what to do. And I saw an ad in the Daily Telegraph. I can picture it now saying, are you? And it was a list of all your criteria. And I thought, yeah, that's me. There's a company called Procter & Gamble. So I applied and I didn't know how lucky I was to get a position at P&G, but uh, it was a great start. Yeah, no, fantastic. Brilliant. And so why then did you go on and create an advertising agency? I became genuinely academically interested almost in the sale of soap powder and you know, shampoo and conditioner and so on, and how advertising impacted on that more than I could as a salesperson. So I became interested in the advertising, so I moved into advertising. It was a natural move. So you built that business for 16 years. It grew and grew every single year. I mean, that's mm. phenomenal. And then you decided, I want out. I mean, was that a bit of a crazy idea to leave then? I was searching for the what next, and I put myself on a course at a Harvard Business School, And I met a guy there, Professor David Bell, who was bright, articulate, as you'd expect, but also very funny. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to be a professor at Harvard. Or if I can't do that, I can do the next best thing. Part comedian, part teacher. And in fact, that's what you did. You you became a professional speaker. And in fact, you're one of the few full-time professional speakers we work with, actually. And so how do you go from that to getting your first paid gig? How did that happen? It's a great question. There was a bit of good fortune, as always with these things. Basically, I made the presentations in the advertising agency and clients would say, can you come and speak at our conference? And then uh, eventually, they, more and more, they were saying, can you come and speak on the conference on anything? Because you're very good and very funny. So I said, look, I'll have to charge you for this. And they said, that's fine. Really? Oh, you get paid for doing this? I didn't know. So when I made the leap, I already had one or two clients and potential clients who said, Phil, if you ever were to do that, I'd book you. And in fact, I, I recall I reserved a whole Monday and a Tuesday to phone clients and potential clients before we told anyone else about my leaving. And I got five paid speaking gigs just during those two days. And then one thing led to another. That's interesting. It, it does go to show that if you're out there on stage speaking, that's the best way to actually get more work. You need to be on stage to get more stage time. It's, it's great, great advice. So you're also you touched on it that you're a little bit of a comedian. I, I think you're a very funny man. And you also you're a bit of a musician. So c- can we ever see you in concert, perhaps doing either of these things? <laughs> I wanted when I was a kid to be the next Ralph McTell, the next Paul Simon, the next Tom Paxton. And I learned to play the guitar and I went busking in London. I got paid a little bit, Maria, but never very much. I was good enough to know I wasn't good enough. 
And so I still play the guitar. In fact, one of my sons is a professional musician and we play together. If I can play live with Ralph McTell at the Royal Albert Hall, that would be my pinnacle. But it's far easier speaking and getting people to laugh than it is getting people to appreciate my singing. <laughs> is it that bad, Phil? <laughs> it's, it's just, as I say, I'm good enough to know I'm not good enough. OK, all right. I, I wish some of the people who go on X Factor would know that. <laughs> but... Yes. Yeah, sure. So you, you famously said that your goal was to change the weather in February, because obviously we live in the UK for anybody that might be listening outside of the UK. And the weather in February is pretty pants. Have you achieved that? A lot of people ask me this. And, and how do you get to be a speaker in Australia? And I always say, well, you buy a ticket and they always laugh. And I said, well, that's stage one, that. Because if it's important, you'll find a way. And if it's not, you'll find an excuse. So I had had this vision, I'd had this dream, and a client of mine from First Direct said, so Phil, when does it start? And I thought, well, it needs to start straight away. I remember that particular day, I'd just uh, left the business. I went and booked two tickets to New Zealand with no work, no idea of how I was going to get the work. I just committed myself to doing it. And then I started the work of finding speaker bureaus and so on. And Luckily, I fell upon someone who wanted to try me and wanted to book me. And so I went to New Zealand, had two gigs. Whilst I was there, because I'd spoken, I got another gig. And then eventually realized Australia is a lot bigger than New Zealand. And every time I speak, I usually get somebody else to say, you know, can, you, can I book you for next year? So now a third of my work is in Australia. I, I live there January, February, March. So you changed the weather in February for yourself? Yes, I've changed it for me. I haven't seen a day in February in England now for 15 years. Oh, that's brilliant. I love that. And I love the fact that you just sort of take that leap and, and trust that it's going to happen. That's very courageous. So you, you write a wonderful blog. Um, yours is one of the few blogs that I religiously read because I really enjoy it. And it has so much humour in it. Can you give us a bit of advice about how we can interject humour into our writing, into our blogs, do you think? Any tips? There's, there's really only one gag, Maria, and the, the, the gag is always about misdirection. You plant a seed, you're going in one direction, and then you go in another, you know, like Velcro. What a ripoff. So you say that in such a way that you mean one thing, and actually the brain works out you mean something else. And so if you just plant that seed in your mind, I need to misdirect people here so that I can trick them, then that becomes uh, the easy humor. The key, I think, is not to do too much. In a typical blog, I might have two or three gags, but not a man walks into a pub with a crocodile under his arm type gags, but just deliberately misdirection or sexual innuendo. Yeah, and what's great is you also have a lot of fact and a lot of content in there, and you remember it because of the gags. Yes, yeah. I do think you learn better when you're smiling and laughing. And uh, I do think if you want to make a very, very serious point, it's good to have the audience warmed up first. And it's what I do as a, as a career. I tell funny stories and then I make the point. And sometimes you can hear a pin drop when you make the point because the, their muscles are relaxed, their brain smiling, laughing, happy, a bang, then you hit them with the real killer point. Yeah. And actually, at one of your speeches, and, and you've used this in a blog too, you made a killer point that really resonated with me. You gave me the best piece of business advice I've ever had. And I've shared that and I've said that it's come from you. So thank you so much. And I try to follow this advice because I think it's golden. That is to do what you say you're going to do. And I, I just find that really powerful. But why do you think that's such a good bit of advice? Why is that so important? I would say having run a business, the biggest single reason people fell out, the biggest single reason there were arguments internally and with clients is because somebody hadn't done what they said they were going to do or somebody hadn't done what somebody thought they were going to do. It took me too long to work it out, Marie. And everybody who joined the business, I used to say as a mantra, first day, let's have a coffee. I appreciate it's difficult the first day. You can't remember people's names. You can't remember where the bathrooms are. Just do what you say you're going to do. Because if you do that, two things happen. One is you become a lot happier because people don't shout at you anymore. People don't disagree with you. And the other thing is you stop making false promises. So don't say to a client, I will phone you back on Friday. Don't do that. Say, I will phone you back as soon as I can, providing if, etc. Yeah, no, it's brilliant advice. And actually, it's great in relationships as well. Do what you say mm. you're going to do or don't promise it, as you said. Fantastic. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you some more advice here, actually, now, seeing as I've got you. I feel like I'm having some private consultancy here. So... 
we're often asked to negotiate on fees. In fact, the, the statement is, are fees negotiable? And I think that really means, can I have a discount? Uh, mm. What would you say is the difference between negotiating and discounting? Well, let's take your specific example that people phone me and say, what's your fee to speak at a conference? And I tell them and they often say, is it negotiable? And first of all, I, I always sound surprised. Oh, um, sorry, sorry, negotiable. What, what do you mean exactly by negotiable? Well, your fee, is it negotiable? Well, what do you want me to negotiate on? Do you want me to be 10% less funny or turn up late or not have handouts? You know, what do you want me to negotiate on? And they realise actually what they're doing. So I then say, I think what you're asking me to do is discount, isn't it? And then they feel dirty. And I say to them, uh, the thing is, it's not fair. It's not fair because if I do a gig for a certain price and you find you've paid more money than them for the same thing, you wouldn't feel good about that. So it's not fair. But generally, when I talk to clients, I'm not naive, Maria. People have to, of course, give in on price and people search for win-win, which usually means compromise, compromise. But I think if you just distinguish between negotiation and discounting, it's a good thing. Discounting, you're just reducing the price. Nothing else changes. Negotiating is when you use expressions like, I can't do that, but what I can do is. Or if you were to, I might be able to. In other words, you're moving, perhaps it might be a time frame, a guarantee, uh, terms, conditions, uh, all manner of things, then you're negotiating. And it's a very, very, very useful thing to say to yourself, am I negotiating or am I discounting? That's awesome advice. I love that. And uh, and I love the fact that I feel dirty when I have to discount too, actually. <laughs> I have to go and have a shower. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but when is the right time to talk about price? Well, it's easy, isn't it, to talk because it's a uh, it can be a confrontational thing, price, to talk about what you need and what you want and what both parts are, and then it comes to the price. And sometimes, whoa, that's way out of my league. That's not what I had in mind. So for me, it's best to talk about it as early as possible. Now, now get the brief, fully understand what it is, but then say, look, and, and if you're frightened of price, the best thing to do is to ask a hypothetical question. Look, for example, in advertising, people used to say, can you come up with some ideas? I don't have a budget. Well, we could come up with some ideas and we've got in mind, you know, half a million pounds, a million pounds, whatever it might be. And they've got in mind nothing like that. So I would always ask the hypothetical question. OK, if I were to come up with ideas that would have you spending about, say, 300,000 pounds, how would you feel about that? Now, that then teases out of them either whether they have got a budget or if they haven't got a budget, the sort of money that would be reasonable. And if they're horrified at that. OK, well, so in other words, we find out what someone's got in mind. And it could be whether you're buying a car or a sofa or you're buying a speaker. Hypothetically, if I were to say £4,000, how would you feel about that? Well, yes, that's the sort of money we had in mind. OK, well, I'm more than that. <laughs> love it. I love it. OK, so here's another one for you. This is a challenge. How do you put your price up? Again, I would ask the hypothetical question. I would say if, if you got a lot of clients and you're, you're frightened of putting the price up. And it's an interesting thing. When interest rates change, quite often clients are forced into putting their prices up. So, again, you ask the hypothetical question to your client. Look, hypothetically, if I were to increase my prices by 10 percent, what would be the implications for you? So, in other words, it's hypothetical anyway. And what I'm asking for is the implications. Now, if the implications are well, you can have, let's take two extremes. If the implications are, it's about time, well, that's okay, isn't it? If the implications, which is more likely, is, well, I just couldn't afford to use your service. I couldn't afford to buy your steel tubes, whatever it is. Okay, just take me through that. What would you do, hypothetically, if I were to put my price up and if you had to go somewhere else, where else, where else would you go? In other words, you try and explore with them together the fact that, if I don't put my price up, I can't make money. If I do put my price up, you go somewhere else, you're probably paying the same money anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that does make sense. The hypothetical question is the best way, Maria. Well, it's interesting you mentioned questions because I know I've seen you speak and I've worked with you for many years. So I know that you love killer questions. So mm -hmm. is this the best way? Is questioning the best way to persuade and to influence people? Yes, I, I believe so. I mean, I've got a situation now where somebody's um, sent me a book and would I read it and, you know, give my view on it? And I don't think it's very good, Maria. In fact, I don't think it's very good at all. So if I 
offer what effectively is criticism, the guy won't like me, he'll take it personally and nothing will change anyway other than our relationship deteriorates. So I'm going to ask him the question, well, what were your objectives for the book? Why did you write the book? You know, where do you see it, for example, in a list of top 10 business books? Do you see it being as good as that? In other words, I tease out of him what he's looking for and then say, you know, what I find with the top business books is... Do you think that matches up to those standards? Does that make sense? I'm, I'm constantly questioning to try and work with him. Do you know, that's fantastic because I, I actually have been asked to give some feedback on a speaker's showreel and actually I think it's terrible. And uh, so I can ask some questions now instead of giving that. I don't, I don't want to be the bad guy. So do you charge for that advice though, Phil? No, I, the only thing I effectively charge for, Maria, is standing and speaking. I don't do consultancy. I don't do one-to-ones. I don't do non-exec directorships. Um, I stand and speak. Fantastic. So, Phil, can you give me an example from uh, from your personal experiences of how you've used your persuasion techniques to get something? Well, a good example would be some work I was due to do for a major bank, and they were going to pay me £25,000 for a roadshow, one of these things where if it's Tuesday, it's Nottingham, and then you wake up and the next day it's Leicester and so on. Um, so doing a roadshow, £25,000. They paid me a £10,000 deposit. And then the division of the bank was sold to someone else, and they cancelled the roadshow. So there's no chance of doing the work because they're going to change the business model. So most people would say, well, maybe I can hang on to the £10,000 deposit, but surely I can't ask for £25,000. And so I had to phone the client back. He left a voicemail message saying, sorry, Phil, this gig's off. And I thought, take your own advice here. Always start the question. So I said to him, hi, how are you? And so on. And I said, how does this uh, impact on you? He said, I'm losing my job. OK, how do you feel about that? He said, I'm fine with that. I've been offered two other jobs already. All oh, right. So the client's happy. I said, OK, this £25,000, if you were me, what would you do? And he said, if I were you, Phil, I'd insist on the full £25,000. I said, if I were to insist on the full £25,000, what would you do? He said, I'd pay it. Send me the bill straight away. And for me, that's a fine example of using a question to find out because people do things for their reasons, not yours. He felt guilty. He felt if he felt bad about the fact that he was cancelling this. And he surely paid me within 48 hours. And it's the best gig I never did. Oh, that's fantastic advice. So finally, Phil, you are the persuasion expert. Can you give me some personal advice on how I can get my own way a bit more often? It always comes down to asking questions. Uh, let's say you want to go to the cinema with your partner. OK, so it's a fairly simple thing. Then you ask him or her, do you think it would be a good thing if we were good to go to the cinema? Would you like to go? And they might say no. I say, OK, if we were to go, I believe this movie is interesting, but will be interesting to you because. Because the, the key thing about all of this, Maria, is people do things for their reasons and not yours. And if we're not careful, we just try and persuade somebody to do something. And you you never go home and say, hey, guess what I've been persuaded to do and feel happy about it. You never go home and say, hey, guess what I've been sold today and feel happy about it. So we need to influence people rather than persuade them. So you have to find out what their motivation is, what not yours is. Oh, that's really good. I just hope that my man isn't listening into this one. <laughs> Phil, thank you so much. That's brilliant. Top advice. Thank you so much indeed. OK, it's a pleasure. So all that remains for me to say is thank you very much for listening. And if you enjoyed this podcast, do let us know and maybe give us a nice rating. Please feel free to share this podcast on social media and do take a look at the show notes for more information about our guests and to find out who's coming up next week. <laughs>